So just to welcome you to the start of this afternoon's session with uh, Jim, Jim Emery, and I've got the wrong glasses on, so I've got to take my glasses off, and the electronic management of assessment. Jim. Thanks much, sure. Hi everybody, good afternoon. Well, thanks for coming back for lunch, it's reassuring, don't be left and at lunchtime uh, to enjoy the fine sun. Uh, I know this is a graveyard shift and I know it's not a very exciting topic or headline, but what I'm going to take through is how GCU were handling the integration, integration of grades assessments with our VLE and with the student information system and what we gain from it and some of the issues. Um, normally I've, I've um, demonstrated this live for people an idea of what it's like, but because we've only got 20 minutes it's going to be a lovely slideshow, so give me for that and I've done some screenshots just to help you through it. Essentially, where I'm starting from is um, obviously I hope you're aware of the assessment life cycle centre um, that's been developed in conjunction with um, Manchester and Met University and obviously JISC. Um, most of the interesting work, the sexy work, for lack of a better expression, is uh, done with all this bit here, the creating part of the various types of assessments that can take place and help our students to feed back to us how they're progressing and help us evaluate our coursework and all that kind of stuff. But one of the big areas is this part down here. Um, is how do we manage get implementing those grades? Because while a lot of work's done in the creation of electronic submission and assessments of different assessment types and so on, a lot of that's still been fed back to students manually as a mark, <coughs> possibly through the VLE or um, automatically or possibly through, from the student information system. But a lot of that's done manually, created manually and fed back manually. So we're doing all the fancy swish electronic development of assessment. But we're not necessarily, we're not anyway at GCU feeding that back. So we just want to take you through um, where we came from, what we're doing, some of the, and where, where we're progressing. This essentially is quite simple, who we were about six months ago. The student information system, like so, which, which we use for transferring all staff, students, and ones into our VLE. Now, in our particular case, it's Blackboard. And down here, we have a range of assessments. Some are run within Blackboard and some outside. Okay? But essentially, no matter what, all the marks, all the grades, are run back into SIS manually. That's it. Sometimes two or three different times. And that, you know, with, with, with all this sophistication we've got here, it seems nuts not to look at. Is there a way of doing it better? And that's what the project start, well, it started from, it began to address. These are some of the drivers. Um, student satisfaction, we reg, we've got 21 days to return. That's in, in, um, 20 working days, sorry, to return all the feedback to students, that includes marks. And it's quite important towards the end of the year, of the academic year, when someone is expecting to graduate, want to know how we're getting on. The other issue is staff satisfaction. Our staff are, are finding it really cumbersome uh, in getting marks across. Sometimes they have to enter marks two or three times, so they compile marks and entries two or three different times, and it's frustrating. And the other thing, of course, is they leave it quite late to the very end until the four assessment exam boards and they meet just because the pressure will work. Is there a better way of doing it? Well, what we found out, we kind of did an analysis, is that we have program administrators who spend short notice, even overnight, punching in lots of different numbers into the, into the student information system. And what we did was we found a rough analysis at a given point in the, during the exam feedback period or the exam marking period with roughly 400,000 individual bits of data entered into the SIS. Now, with a three-week return and time, for example, it's a massive amount of work. So these people are really efficient in doing this. The system might not be necessarily, but occasionally the SIS will crash, and that adds to time. So these are all the problems. Um, so, but how can you be more effective in doing this? And that's another driver. And the last part was that Price, Waterhouse, Cooper were really concerned about data integrity about marks being misplaced, it wrongly entered, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that was about 18 months we produced that. So these are the sort of integration drivers which started off the project. Um, one approach to the project that started on marks integration, uh, sorry, marks development, was that the academic staff enter their own marks directly into the student information system. Now the reaction to that, I'll leave you to decide what it's going to be like, but that was a no bore okay? The second one was we created, some, some colleagues created a really quite complex paper in a digital age, a paper-based system involving downloading spreadsheets and copying stuff into <coughs> fancy forms and then taking the forms and again the program administrators would load the forms up into the student information system. 
So that was a kind of, can, they, can, that, program, can that process be improved? Yes, it can be, but was it smart? Well, it wasn't entirely smart because it's still, although using some one or two digital tools, like a spreadsheet digital, it wasn't actually doing anything more sophisticated than, at the end of the day, somebody sitting punching in numbers. Okay. So that was one, one solution. The third solution is, in fact, as, as ISIS is our student information system, come back to that later on for you. It's not to do with terrorism. By the way, IS is the name for information service departments. We have issues IS and ISIS, so we do have these problems. Um, although some people do refer to Blackboard as Daesh, so that's another issue. Um, so what we have here in the ISIS, we have our, we have our, our session components. Um, and just as we can transfer the modules, the staff and the marks into, into our VLE, what, what we've done is we actually can transfer the assessments as structured um, in, <coughs> pardon me, in uh, Student Information System straight into Blackboard's Grade Centre, but whatever you use, feel free. Um, and then what, what then happens is, no matter what, we have different ways of entering module marks into there, and what then happens is that through, I'm going to use my colleague Sheila McNeil's expression, automagically populates the Student Information System. That's what we're trying to do, and that's what we've been working on. And that came out, and that was the proof, this is where I came into it because if I sort of mentioned why are you doing this other way, Blackboard has released, that's our VLA just plan, has released this integration tool. So that then said, let's go with that. So we discounted colleagues, academic colleagues, typing number, numbers in, that was out the window. The other way was looking at this kind of paper based and a sort of semi digital system, but the smart way is this. If we can get the majority of our marks in this way, that's what we're trying to do. So what does that entail? This here is a view of the student information system with the structures inside. These are the areas which we get our structure format from, <coughs> our assessment structure formats from CW1, CW2. What then happens is they go into Blackboard and that automatically creates CW1, which is a test, CW2, an assignment. That then goes into Grade Center, like so, marks created and then transferred across. Now that was, that was an IS viewpoint of how it was going to happen. Because as far as they were concerned, um, and I don't mean the terrorists, I mean our, into our IT department, or well, we might call them that now and again, they, they thought that this was um, the only way we tried, this is the only way we carried out assessments. That, that's it. We didn't realise, and this is, a, this is where I came, I said, no, no, we've got lots of different assessment tools, a lot of different assessment practices. You cannot tie it down. And that's what Blackboard did. That's what Blackboard does, essentially. It ties it down to the, their assessment types. Not good enough because of the range of greater, great creative assessment practices that people do. So how do we overcome that? How, how do we get around that? And these are examples, some ones we are using. There's tons of others. Uh, obviously, mentioned Turn It Ever, with the placements, wikis. And, and this thing, so we can actually put the results from traditional class-based exams or big, you know, four or five hundred all sitting scribbling away for two or three hours, or lucky if they're still using, if they're using computers, we can somehow get that into, into, in, in, into the grade centre in Blackboard, and then we can then bring that across automatically. So that's what we're trying to do. So we're not tying it down, if it seems to be Blackboard doing this, our IS department said no, we have to recognise that we have a whole range of assessments out there during the time. So what, what was happening is that what we do is, no matter what assessment you create, it could, a column is somehow created manually or automatically, or you can turn it in in Grade Centre like so. So there's one there, for example. Um, we'll call that CW1. What then happens then is we link that column to the ISIS created column. Now that means it's hidden from students. That's a straightforward linkage job. Now, the reason I've called that too many clicks. That was condemned as too hard. People are too hard. People are more concerned about people punching lots of numbers rather than use a simple process of manipulating the data in a table. That's all that is. So that's what we did. So if we have two or three um, SIS created columns, we're able to, no matter which assessment there is so far, we've managed to create them all. We've managed to link them to the relevant one. Once that happens, you then use the managed format within Grade Center, and all the all the col our colleagues have to do is just press that button there. And that then transfers within half an hour into the student information system. That's how simple it is, if only. <laughs> but that's the process of it, and that's what we're aiming, to, aiming, aiming for. So we've still had time spent on, on that. But one thing I said, that's been that's a criticism of that process, too many clicks. Whereas, in fact, people are quite happy to work with the big numbers and number inputs. 
So we're going to have a couple of uh, pilot evaluations, um, pilot two, one two pilots. So one can't give the current one just now, so still going through it. The earlier one was um, one of the things we found out: the module descriptors, colleagues aren't really cleaning all the components of our, soft, of, of, of our assessments. For example, they only said they did one coursework. When we looked at it, all well, ISIS created one column. We had colleagues who were sitting two or three, then broken down to two or three subcomponents. Now, if they had declared those subcomponents in module descriptors and they appeared in a student information system, these columns would appear automatically and make it nice and easy. So, we had that problem. Oh, sorry. Um, the other issue is that all instructors can transfer, every instructor on a module can transfer a map, so we have to put a process in place. So, we asked them, collecting a bunch, bunch of people, do you want your program administrator to do the maps transfer or do you want a representative of the academic community to do transfer? And currently, currently, it's the module leader that does that. We may change that later by using the rules. <coughs> so I keep pressing on things, forgive me. The other issue is that all of Grade Centre is locked down. That means it's frozen, you cannot see it. Um, and that's a downside of things because we still we run our module assessments and module evaluations using Blackboard Survey Tool just now. And if you lock Grade Centre down, you cannot see the results of that survey. So we have to ask colleagues before we really transfer our marks. Um, try and export, but nine times out of ten, they don't have that time. So that, that's quite, quite an issue. So we're asking, um, we're back to Blackboard to get that fixed. And finally, we create a whole community with lots of examples of example, how to do all these linkages, linkages uh, how to operate it. And only 50% of the trial participants went into this area to look at it. It's a case of the old story. Uh, I've got to get my marks in tomorrow how to do it without even looking at what was there for them. Planning. And these were people selected by the, by the schools, not, 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 not by us. So that threw that up, but essentially the feedback was the process is quite simple, they could, they could work with it. Where we are just now, um, we're still waiting, this time around with volunteers, we actually put an email out, who wants to volunteer to, to take part? Um, so we're still waiting some feedback on that, it's supposed to, it won't be right until next week. It has been confirmed that this is vital. We've got to have part only at the ISIS created column should be locked down, the rest of the grade centre should be free for them to use. Um, I don't know if you all run composite sites, but um, these are kind of when all the modules, a series of modules are linked together for a variety of reasons, like they all have the same learning materials um, um, and, and they're created using the SharePoint tool. The big problem is that ISIS doesn't create the column headings uh, for these composites, um, but what we'll get around, around that now because we still have the original module codes. So all their learning materials will take part in placing composites, but the assessment practice will take part in each individual module. A bit clunky. The other area is this one here, the reset modules. Setting that up with our current student information system is too difficult. It's been really quite set up lots and lots of different modules. So we're accepting the fact that we may have to be still go down manual input, but if we're talking about 10% of the marks, maybe as opposed to 90%, it's something we're going to have to just bite the bullet with. And finally, we're about to recommend the rollout plan. What we're planning to do is, um, is to have all level one modules next year take part in this. No big bang, things across, sorry, across all the community, just level one. As somebody rightly pointed out, risk averse as we are, um, if you make it level three or level four, we, and things go wrong, we might get some bad feedback in the end, says survey. So somebody's obviously thinking ahead. So we're looking at level one, that'll be confirmed if we continue with it. So that's where we're at just now. Some comments here, I'll let you read those. Notice they're all positive, and I'll read you out the bad ones. I don't want to make to see the bad ones on the screen. On the negative feedback. But as you can see, it's been fairly good. Um, many colleagues not use Grade Centre, which can be slightly awkward to set up correctly. Well, it's not, it's automatically. Sometimes staff don't like change, are skeptical about new initiatives, new university, and all waste time. <laughs> That's the kind of feedback I've had, but essentially, as you can see here, there are some benefits coming through. And I think it's quite important that, that we're demonstrating this, working with colleagues. That's the key point, they're learning from it. And, I, um, and so far, the majority of feedback has been very positive in terms of they all like the one button you have to press. And what you forget about is getting to preparation right in that in advance. And that's my advice. If you are going down to any kind of grade marks integration between your BLE, and your student information system, have a good look at your assessment structures. We've managed to capture as many as we can, we're not comprehensive on that, but we'd like to think that no matter the principle we're working on, if we can get the assessment structure into a great centre in Blackboard, we'll be able to export it into the student information system. 
and the amount of time perhaps of effort and the benefits like, um, that means in terms of making examples, schedules, taking pressure off the programme administrators, they can focus on managing the results in the student information system, they can run their own rules. These are the kind of things we're aiming for. Linked to that, this is a statement that um, here, let me read yourselves, but this is the current <coughs> overall context in which we're working. We're trying to move towards being a digital university. If we stay a mix of manual, digital, and analog, we will not be a digital university. This, this is a tiny little step in that programme we're aiming towards. Okay, bit of a fly through, bit of a rush. Um, but hopefully that gives you a kind of idea of what we're trying to do as part of a bigger programme within GCU. And, um, yeah, we're still going strong, so there'll be more next year on it, and uh, I'll, I'll update you. I'll be blogging about it and keep you up to date. So, 25 minutes. Time's up. Any questions? Just the next questions. Any questions? It's the afternoon, Steph. I've got one. This is from my history of what they would have to say, so how much did you flush out that actually some of the parents were doing more assessment than they officially said they were doing? You know, camera just like that. Hugely, 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 but they were breaching our own quality guidelines, which we have to declare them out form summative assessment up front, and that's flushing it out enormously. It's causing a problem um, elsewhere. But from the resolution of that, if they're not declaring the subcomponents, we're able to resolve it through through this trick, the two tricks and grade center. Yeah. It's good for student experience actually up front, but well, vital. That's just bringing it through. It's addressing bigger issues. So solving one problem is releasing or making the university way of other issues that have got to be addressed. Good. That's a good question. There's a bit of a headache actually for you. Does the two-way process of assignment creation and marks going back work identically for Turnitin assignments as Blackboard native as long as, long as as long as you can bring, you create a Turnitin call in the Grade Centre, you link that Grade Centre, Turnitin Grade Centre call to the Student Information System. That's all we do. Mm. If, you, if, you, if you put your mark in, turn it in, the top right, 60, that automatically goes into grade centre, the column you've created. All you then have to do is link that mm. to the student information system column. It's allowing flexibility of assessment rather than just tie it down. If you only have two assessment tools on Blackboard, and that's what IS, uh, IS department colleagues said, we don't really need to, we don't have a whole range of assessment tools we use out with portfolios, all those kind of things. We can bring all that in. It's, it's the flexible approach. It's, Looking at paid centres that contain that sort of thing, just do tie yourself down to my recommendations. That would be the recommendation, and they don't all know. Um, what's the quote here? My colleagues do not currently use grade centre. So, what they do with their marks, they put them onto bits of paper. I've got one extreme example of a colleague who puts stuff down on bits of paper, this is flushed out to you, your turn. Um, one bit of paper sent to the PA, who then typed it up, typed it up into a Word document, who then sent it back, hopefully the email attachment, to this guy, who then looked at it, moderated them, then sent it back to the program administrator, who then had to fill in, said, no, I can't accept this because you've got to fill in a particular input form, went back to this guy, who then put the individual marks in manually, who then sent it back to the administrator, who then typed them all in. Nuts. But that's, that's what was happening in certain years. So for people who may not want to use Grade Centre, there are benefits if you can get their marks and scores or whatever is into Grade Centre and just do the transfer. Huge benefits. So the recommendation is that all assessments will run in Grade Centre from not like the set fact there may be something out there we're not aware of that may not be running better. And it'll be good for the students. You're letting students see all the summative results, all the informative ones will come automatically from the aid centre, no problem. The summative ones, subject to the final module, module application and validation exam boards, will then be released through the student information service centre, uh, sorry, student information system, which is the golden copy, because all the rules in terms of the, 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 the ratings of them. I'll take one more question. Uh, yeah, no, just uh, following on actually, that question in terms of the summative assessments, do you release <coughs> your exam grades to students through the Blackboard courses? 
there's uh, two, two ranges of taxes. Some sort of colleagues do, and others don't. But for the first time ever, we're actually having a written exam going to Grade Centre, and that's what, I won't go into details on this, but that's causing a problem. So the project sponsors were saying we don't want students to see any of the written some of the exam results. So that column has had to be in. We did that automatically in Grade Centre. But we now, and that causes problems in terms of a similar work. Change a different workflow for in, but we're now going to change all that. We're going to have a standard workflow of attaching weighted columns to one another. Yes, hello, um, my name is Joy Howitt and I'm the team leader for Learning Technologies um, at Dundee and Angus College. And last year, or it was slightly before last year, we, we went for a bit of funding. It wasn't a huge amount, but it was enough to um, start on us off on our innovative journey. Um, and at about the same time, we had a space down at the bottom of, of the college that was kind of a basement space. It was getting redeveloped. Um, so at that point, we, we managed to, to nab a, a classroom in effect, and we've turned it alongside some of the innovative technology that we bought into what we call um, a learning lab. Um, the learning lab, we, we sort of, it's, it's not the biggest room in the world because we are trying for space in here, but it is. Um, Yeah, working today. Um, but the, you know, it, it's a great space because all the t when we bought the furniture, all the furniture we bought was, was movable, so we can sort of transform it as we look at new technology to, to bring in to explore in the learning lab. So we shift things about and we can move tables about um, and everything's perfectly movable. So um, why the learning lab? Um, I think it's about, this is, this is our principal, um, Gran, and he's with the, the director of CBI Scotland um, down visiting the Learning Lab at one of their conferences that they held here. Um, but he said it quite well, you know, it's, it's, it's looking into the future. It's about, you know, as a result, we've got a responsibility to let, look at the technology that's coming up. It's all around us, it's never changing, it's everywhere. It's from, you know, age this to, to you know, um, you know, old age, um, it's, it's just everywhere. So we need to really be starting to look around what's around the corner and how that helps us and how that impacts us. So the aim of the learning lab that we had was really to, you, to, to introduce users to, to innovative technology, right? To have a look around that corner, to see what perhaps could be coming. Now, some of it, as you know, will, will, will drop off and it'll never go anywhere and then it'll rise up again. But um, we want to provide a space that would provide creative learning opportunities. A bit of a space to explore and play and learn and create and see where it took us. So, what sort of to experiment with? What did we get? Well, I apologise now, but I'm going to sound a little bit like the gadget shows prize fun. I'm going to have to read it. So, stop it. We have Six laptops, six iPads, two 3D printers, two Oculus Rift and Samsung Gear, they are headsets, a structure sensor, an Xbox with Kinect, a Phantom 2 drone, a time lapse camera, three GoPro cameras, a visualizer, live spec heads, myo bands, an interactive screen, a large ATX TV. <laughs> 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 I didn't know they were in the It's not a prize fund, <laughs> we're keeping it all. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of technology, considering that we've really only got this sort of just after the summer kind of thing. We only opened up the Learning Lab in November. Um, my team have had their heads, you know, buzzing with lots of playing with and experimenting with, with technology. So um, one of the big draws in, in the Learning Lab has been virtual reality. Some people were mentioning that earlier on. And none of us are developers in, in my particular team. So we're not coming from the aspect of, of maybe going out and developing virtual reality. What we're looking at it is there's all these companies out there that are producing fantastic content. So do we actually need to go out and develop something for a very small audience 
which is going to cost, well, like we said, you know, how many, you know, X number of pounds to produce, you know, 10 minutes of, of VR, when actually what we want to do is explore what's already out there and try and find where that might fit in to enhance learning within the classroom. So we found lots of kind of different, different examples and, you know, I think uh, Palmer are looking for the founder of, of Oculus. I'm not sure I quite agree with them, but I know where he's coming from. You know, he thinks there's lots of potential for virtual reality in education. Totally agree with that. I'm not sure about kids don't learn based by reading books, but I think what he's getting at is exactly like uh, if any of you got young kids, mine, if they want to know something, they don't go to a book now, they go to YouTube. Um, and I think we're coming up with a generation who is very, in, you know, interested in getting their knowledge from, you know, media-rich type of, um, you know, content. And virtual reality is that, that next step. Um, come on to that. Come on to that in a minute. But if you can imagine, you know, where it, it can impact on, so, you know, it's been used in training and simulations for things like healthcare is very big on it, the oil industry, where there's dangerous situations and they get a real life experience in that. It's getting, you know, it's very interesting in the, in the care, sort of, you know, for, you know, dis for disabilities, for people who are housebound. It can have great impact on that. So it's kind of touching almost every curricular area that we have in college, in a certain extent. But it's also brilliant for learning, if you find the right apps that are out there. So some of them um, are like, you know, learn to cook. We found fun in that there. Didn't help my cooking, but I didn't use it enough. Because I was too busy, because, you know, VR is when you put the headset on, and you're totally immersed in this 360 world. And I put the headset on, and I went, oh, let it cook, great. So the recipe comes up, and I've got my ingredients, and I've got my lovely kitchen, and I've got to shake the wok pan, and I've got to add the ingredients at the right time. And, and then Green Books Interactive, so it tells you when you should be adding an ingredient. What am I doing? Wow! That is the kitchen! <laughs> brilliant! But I'm so busy looking around this fantastic kitchen that I forgot to put the mushrooms in the thingy at that time. The oil had burned. And it didn't, we don't quite have the smell vision yet, so I didn't quite realise it burnt the ingredients. So we have cracks up again. But really good, I mean, I mean just, just that sort of interactive kind of lesson there about doing recipes in a slightly different way. Um, there's, there's an app out there that helps you, you can upload your presentation. I don't think you, yeah, it's right, but you can upload your pet presentation, but if you've got fear of speaking, you, you, you're, you virtually do your talk in front of an audience. So you're, you're in this conference room, your presentation is up behind you, your audience is in front of you virtually. This one's great, I love this one. Um, it's, it's a demo, a demo stage at the moment, but that's what we're gonna, that's what we're waiting on. We're waiting on it kind of coming out. Um, but do you remember that, I think it was about 1987, 1980s movie called Inner Space? And he miniaturizes into this thing, this is that, that's that, this is that. So what you do is you miniaturize down this tiny cell and you go swimming through the bloodstream and you see all these red blood cells coming flying the and there's a cut in the wall and you fly through there and you see, a cell. So, you know, for things like learning about the human body, fantastic virtual reality experience. And a situation you would never really get from maybe so much from a textbook. You know? So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at the apps that are out there and we're looking at how which areas that might be interesting. Oh sorry about this if you don't like spider. But yeah, you know, um, cognitive behaviour therapy, there's apps out there for all sorts of things. So for dealing with phobias and fears. So these can help overcome that, that kind of thing. And in fact, if you, you go on and read anything about virtual reality, there's, there's almost an app for all sorts of different areas across the whole curriculum. So that's probably where we're coming from. So rather than developing it, we're looking at what's out there and what we can bring into, into the classroom. We're also playing about a little bit with augmented reality. So we've got our iPads out. And the difference with that is, you know, you're, you're overlaying a bit of digital data on top of real world, kind of. So some examples of that would be in retail. Um, when you're going out looking at your sofa, I care about, oh, is that going to fit in that corner? Oh, is that going to go on my decor? And you're on your app, 
then I'm an app for, for, for seeing that piece of furniture within your room and, and, and does it work? For the first time ever last year, the, probably the first one I came across actually without realising it was, was Dulux when they brought out their augmented painting. Brilliant. Start in the living room and went, oh, and you get to, you know, you see your wall and you get to choose yellow, nah, blue, nah, let's be going back, nah, what, nah, just, ended up with a lovely shade of green, really nice. And um, so, and, and for the first time ever, I didn't come home with six test pots of paint to do that. So it's moving into things like retail, and um, we're playing about with it. Some of the book textbooks ideas, so this is like a, a diagram of textbooks but you, you overlay it with an iPad and up comes sort of the human body and it's a 3D skeleton and you can, you can layer it so you can take that, that skeleton down to just down the skeleton then you can add the muscles in and then you can add the circulatory system and then you've got the body, so all sorts of that and we're playing with it for perhaps um, where there's limited access to computers and works at workplaces. So in engineering, they might have a machine to use. They've given them a safety drill about how to use and what not to do. But Joe Bloggs is late. So in comes Joe Bloggs. And if we have a little poster up that he can use his app on, it can play the video. So 30 second video about remember what you can and can't do. So the lecture doesn't have to repeat himself. So we're looking at things like that as well as augmented reality. So kind of all the interest that's kind of coming out about this, we got in touch with um, some people that we've had connections with in Dundee and Angus who were using VR and, and augmented reality in some local projects. And we invited them along and we got um, almost 300 staff and students coming along to find out what the implementation of this was. Um, and, you know, one of the you know, uses of it was, you, you know, in Dundee we're getting a, a new v &A museum, art museum. It's not built yet, it's got lovely foundations <laughs> are down and there's a big, you know, wall and the roadworks are a nightmare, but it's, it, it's coming. However, um, you know, one of the companies had, had um, created for the Oculus Rift, you know, a VR image of exactly what the building's going to look like from the inside. So that helped. Not only with architectural drawings, but it helped with marketing, it helped with fundraising, it helped get the public on site, it's helping with tourism. So lots of uses there. And I think, you know, John's been mentioning this as well, but along the waterfront they've even they've put a boards up with a sort of picture story of the kind of history of design. I think Scotland about the fall for wheel and things like this. But some of the boards are interactive, so it's using a bit of augmented reality to show you what behind the boards is going to look like. So, and um, in Maniki County Park, this is just another use of augmented reality, but they have, have this is technical theatre, for goodness sake. It's not computing, it's technical theatre or something. But he was, the Simon McIntyre was, this is really in his theatre. And he's mixing sort of these, these sort of shows with, um, with technology. And what he's done is he's, he's got this whole part of the Maniki Wood and he decks it out and it's a big mystery tour and you've got to find these scientists that disappeared who are trying to protect dra dragon eggs. And it's great if you, if you get a chance to go along and get around the area. But I took my kids along, I had their iPad. And what they've got to do is go and find the magical creatures. So, you know, they go up and find the tree and they, they hold up their iPad and up pops a unicorn or a fairy or a goblin or a flying fox. But yeah, so, so again, tourism. The other thing we've got um, that's quite popular is, well, I like the 3D capture. So we've got a structure sensor which attaches to an iPad and it's dead simple. We can literally just walk around something like this. And here well, we've got them in 3D. Brilliant. And um, so we've got them in 3D, dead quick. And we're paying them out. <laughs> no, it's great. We, we get lots of stamp groups in, um, and, and at least one of them goes away with a little 3D printer for themselves. So, um, we've got two 3D printers in the learning lab, both do a slightly different job. This one's probably our most popular one that we use at Ultimaker. Um, but there's also lots sorts of other things that we find. We, we go on websites like Thingiverse, and someone will ask us for something, and they'll download and go, Yep, yeah, it's one Thingiverse, we can print it for you. 
say, we've not quite got the skills yet that we're actually creating things to print using CAD because we don't have CAD skills, but there's people in the college with those skills, so we're looking for them next year. Um, Probot doesn't seem like an emerging technology or that, I never have, but actually it was just a request that someone, when we were looking for ideas, what we could get, and someone said Probots, and I went, well, you know what, they're not that expensive, let's get a set in. These have been great. These have been fab for um, lots of areas. You think kind of these little programmable cars are more like basic primary school programming. Well, no, not really. That's a fun. You should see of us. We had the protractors out trying to work out angles. Um, so you can get these cars to, to program squares or triangles or write out things like we are the best. That's where we all got stuck. <laughs> what the heck's an angle for? What? So we, uh, we've had the protractors, uh, and then we had the maths team down because we, we thought maybe it would be really good for them to use. Um, and they got to get competitive. You should have seen Elaine, the maths team, don't know how she did it, forget about the protractors. She had this weird and wonderful, I don't know if anybody teaches maths, but she had this weird and wonderful way of working out angles. <coughs> uh, bits of paper, and, and she's seen her calculations, it was amazing. But they, um, the thing we found was, it wasn't just about that, it was for team building and numeracy and problem solving, estimating distance for their supported education students, things like that, really simple things. So we've been kind of marketing it much more than just basic programming. So we've had computing students down, we've had care students down, we've had supported <coughs> education and course skills in. We've also got a DJI Phantom Drone, which I don't know where can you fly that, so there are a few regulations around flying drones around the place. But um, it's been brilliant. A couple of places it's been really good at uh, in is sports have been really interesting in terms of getting an overview of games where they can do a bit of analytics, marketing, kind of any outdoor event. But one of the big areas that's probably going to take off you know, next year is um, building surveying. We've got building surveying students. And um, John Mitchell and that, that area had said it would be really good if they could use the drone to get a survey of a historic buildings, so Camperdown House, it's a historic building. And he spoke with Dundee City Council, and they're both getting something out of it because we got to fly over the top of this building to look at the. And I don't know when the last time anybody looked at the top of this building, well, except for the thieves that stole half the lead, that, that was why they were doing the survey. Um, and, but you can imagine the cost of putting that scaffold in. The, the health and safety that goes into sending someone up on, on a roof that you don't know whether it's stable, compared to 20 minutes up the drone, photographed the whole area and back down again. And the students were able to use that within their own project, and the city council got a look at the roof. So, really good collaborative project there. Uh, just a quick mention, yeah, mobile technologies is just kind of part of the learning lab. We've got a special interest group and we keep every now and again asking people what, what's, what they're using the mobile devices for. Uh, sports are using them really big and you know, using huddle technique, uh, looking at analytics and video and what students are doing. We're doing it for things like quizzes and Nearpod and all those kind of things. So what's kind of, where are we now and what kind of feedback have we got? Um, we've got amazing feedback. These students that come in, they just, they, they, they love it from the first part of, of walking in and going, oh wow, because it's sort of like a classroom with desks and tables and chairs and a blackboard kind of thing. It just looks a bit different. It's got all these cool technology. Um, and I was in the other day, and I met someone, I heard, I, I heard this, this first thing a student came in and went, wow, man, this is sick. And I was like, well, I've heard enough Julie Essex, that thing, wink, that means it's good. <laughs> But yeah, no, they go, they, they, go, they go out actually really buzzing from it. And that's what I think looking at new technology is about. You know, it's looking at something I've tried. Um, I don't want to be responsible for the number of probably VR headsets that were requested at Christmas time just when we opened the doors. <laughs> we did try to say there are cheap cardboard versions for, for less than a tenner. But what next? I think, you know, what we've had is really six, seven months of introducing technology. We've delivered over, our team ourselves have delivered over 60 hours of introductory sessions into this kind of technology to spark 
kind of interest from the curriculum and interest from students and trying, you know, to enhance that learning. And we invite staff now to come in and use the learning lab as a learning space to use the technology so that we don't have to get a set of virtual reality goals for every curriculum area. They can come down and use that space. But um, even so, you know, art and design now have their own uh, purchased a 3D printer and are going to be embedding 3D printing in some of their courses. Computing are changing their programme this year because they want to be able to do programming in Unity for virtual reality. HN Animation and Design are now taking it these to you know, develop 3D sort of environments, but they now want to take it to the next step and introduce virtual reality. And building services want to create a unit on drone surveying. So there are already in that short seven months pockets where actually we're going to start to see some of this get embedded in the curriculum. And we're going to set up special interest groups because for all that my team have been enthusiastically trying to sort of upskill themselves in all these areas. What we actually want is lecturers from out the curriculum and we want students to get involved in these groups to come up with some projects that actually do some, something quite meaningful. So that's probably our next, next step. And then we'll look at the next set of new technology that we can, we can promote. So um, one of the things, I don't know if time wise, where we're at, but um, one of the things we wanted to do was let you get a chance to have hands on um, some of our uh, technology. We have sort of probably an, uh, four groups, so we've got a little bit of it. Those who want to get their hands on a little mini drone, not the big CGI drone, but a little mini drone, just have a bit of fun with. We, we've got um, a room set aside for that. We have um, a visit to the learning lab to do 3D capture and 3D print just to see how quick it is to get you printed before you go away today. And out in the atrium we have a little taster of augmented reality, virtual reality headsets and Probox. So um, if you want to do the drone or myself with uh, the learning lab, come down to the learning lab and see the 3D sort of printers, uh, John and me, so I'm to follow. And if you want to have a look at VR headsets and robots, then, then hang about the atrium just outside. Um, and we, yeah, we invite you to just experience a little bit of what, what our students have had a chance to Hi folks, really just the, the, the penultimate session. <laughs> Lorna Campbell is going to have a chat about you. Do both topics or whatever? No, I am going to be talking about Open Door Ed and then I'm going to So it's going to be a Lorna, I'll let you read off. Thanks, Joe. Uh, my name is uh, Lorna Campbell and I work at the University of Edinburgh, um, where I am OER liaison for Open Scotland. Um, and I'm going to be talking today about um, supporting. Um, engagement with learning technology through open education um, at the University of Edinburgh. And then what I'll do is I'll pass it over to Susie. Um, there was going to be another presentation from our colleague um, Fiona Hale who was going to be talking about um, learning design at the University of Edinburgh but unfortunately she couldn't make it here today. Um, so, um, earlier this uh, year the University of Edinburgh launched a new strategic vision which outlined where the university is at present and where it intends to be in 2025. Central to this vision is increased provision of world-leading online distance learning. And it's an ambitious vision um, that aims to see up to 10,000 students learning online by 2020 through MOOCs and postgraduate online learning programmes and open education embedded right across the institution. Now, I'm not going to talk about uh, the MOOCs or the online master's programmes per se today. What I want to focus on is how the university is supporting engagement with learning technology through a range of open education initiatives and particularly focusing on open educational resources. So the university has a vision for OER, um, building on three strands. The history of the Edinburgh settlement, excellent education research collections, and traditions of the Enlightenment and the university's civic mission. 
The university has established uh, an OER service that will create an OER exchange to enrich both the university and the sector and to provide support frameworks to enable staff to share OER created as a routine part of their work and to enable staff to find and use high quality teaching materials developed both within and without the university. So it's very much about openly licensing existing teaching and learning materials already used within the institution. <coughs> The service will also showcase Edinburgh at its best, highlighting the highest quality learning and teaching, identifying collections of learning materials to be published online for flexible use and made available as open courseware, and enabling the discovery of these materials to enhance the university's reputation. So although it's very much about getting resources out there, there is very much a reputation aspect to this as well. And as a contribution to the university's civic mission, it will open access to Edinburgh's treasures, making available collections of unique resources to promote health, economic and cultural well-being. Digitising, curating and sharing major collections of unique archives and museum resources to encourage public engagement with learning, study and research. And there's actually a programme already ongoing in the library at the University of Edinburgh to openly licence as many of their collections as possible. And they're starting with the collections that they already have the copyright to, and they're quietly CC licensing uh, those collections. There's been no big public announcement about this yet. They're still working towards that, but that's just work that's ongoing already in the university. In order to ensure that Edinburgh's OER vision is sustainable and supported across the institution, the Senate Learning and Teaching Committee approved an accompanying OER policy that encourages staff and students to use, create and publish OERs to enhance the quality of the student experience and to help colleagues make informed decisions about creating and using OER to support the university's OER vision. Now this policy will actually look um, very familiar um, to some of you uh, because it's the same policy that was developed by the University of Leeds as part of the UK OER programme and this policy has already been adopted uh, by the University of Greenwich and also by Glasgow Caledonian University. But each university that has adopted uh, this policy has changed it slightly and again of course that's one of the beauties of the Creative Commons licence and one of the changes that Edinburgh University has made is to the definition of what an open educational resource is. Um, so in the Edinburgh policy, OER is defined as digital resources that are used in the context of teaching and learning, which have been released by the copyright holder under an open license permitting their use or repurposing by others. And what's interesting about this change is it focuses more on the context of use rather than the type of resource. So it's basically anything that could usefully be used in teaching and learning can be considered as an open educational resource. Uh, if an open license is applied to it. And of course this means that it also encompasses cultural heritage resources. In order to provide access to its open educational resources, the university has launched Open.ed, a one-stop shop that provides access to openly licensed content and OER, the OER vision statement and the OER policy, together with practical support for staff and students in the form of workshops, advice and guidance on finding, using and creating OERs. And there are a number of staff associated with the OER service at the university um, who are there to provide help and guidance and who run these workshops and training events. Um, I should add that Open.ed isn't actually a formal repository, um, it's basically just a WordPress site. And what it's doing is it's aggregating content from other collections across the university. Um, the reason for this is this is a very new service, um, so rather than go down the route of investing in an actual OER repository, uh, the university has decided just to aggregate what's already there for the time being and make it available through this WordPress front end. This may change as the service develops, but at the moment uh, what you see is really a very simple WordPress interface. In addition to Open.ed, um, the university has also launched Media Hopper, a new multimedia asset management system which provides all staff and students with space to upload media and publish it to the LE's websites and social media channels. Not all the content in Media Hopper is open licensed, 
but we've suddenly got currently got some uh, student interns working to develop feeds to pull out the open access <coughs> content that is in Media Hopper and feed it into open.ed. And that's they're number one of a number of student interns who are working across the university just now on short-term paid contracts to gain experience working with the university systems. Um, so you'll already find quite a lot of open license content in there, including all the videos from the OER 16 conference, for example. Uh, and you can, you can um, although this is um, internal to Edinburgh University, there is a public facing front end, and you can um, you can go look at um, that URL there. Uh, Edinburgh is also working to enhance the biggest open educational resource in the world, Wikipedia. Um, building on long-term engagement with Wikimedia UK, the university has become the first in the UK to employ a, a Wikimedian in residence. And although there are other Wikimedians in residence at other universities uh, in the UK, they are all associated with libraries. So for example, the University of Oxford has had a Wikimedian in residence at the Bodleian Library. Edinburgh University's Wikimedian in residence is very much focused on the entire university, not just on the library. And their role is very much um, to enhance um, the quality of open knowledge and the quantity of open knowledge by contributing to Wikimedia and also to increase the university's commitment to digital literacy. So it's very much about increasing staff digital literacy. And of course, one of the ways um, that this has been done is through um, Wikimedia editor funds and training events. Um, there's already been quite a large number of these in the university, um, and many of them are focused on increasing the profile of entries about women in Wikimedia and Wikipedia, um, which are notoriously low. Um, so there's already been one on the history of medicine. There's been another one recently on women in espionage. Uh, there's already been a number on, to coincide with Ada Lovelace Day. And this year we can uh, also look forward to two editathons to coincide with the Day of the Dead. Um, and, and that is actually going to be using obituaries to create or enhance Wikipedia ed entries on alumni of the university. And there's going to be another one about the literary tradition of the Edinburgh Gothic uh, to coincide with Robert Louis Stevenson's birthday. So there are always, um, they're always actually really fun events as well. Um, the university is also committed to supporting open education across the sector, and last year announced its support for Open Scotland. Open Scotland is a cross-sector initiative that aims to raise awareness of open education and encourage the sharing of open education policy and practices and OER to benefit all sectors of Scottish education. And it's part of my role as OER liaison for Open Scotland to continue to promote the Scottish Open Education Declaration and hopefully to bring it to the attention of the new Cabinet Secretary uh, for Education and Skills. Now, the Alt Scotland SIG has been instrumental in supporting the work of Open Scotland um, and We've tried several times in the past um, to bring the declaration to the attention of the Cabinet Secretary um, and Linda has contacted both Angela Constance and Mike Russell in the past about the declaration um, and we got a fairly positive response from Mike Russell. We didn't get a great deal from Angela Constance, it's hard to be said. Um, we now have John Swinney in post. We don't know if we'll have any more luck with him. Um, but we will certainly try to bring the declaration to their awareness. And basically what all this is about is really about trying to encourage the Scottish Government to get behind the idea that publicly funded educational resources should be available under open licence. That really there is no justification for locking up publicly funded educational resources behind copyright. And of course, last night, but, but not least, um, last year we were very privileged uh, to host, last year, earlier on this year, it seems like such a long time ago now, we were very privileged uh, to host the OER 16 Open Culture Conference um, at the University. Um, this was the seventh um, OER conference, but the very first one in Scotland. Um, Joe Wilson and I were at the first OER conference in Cambridge seven years ago. And uh, while we were listening to John, uh, Sir John Daniel giving his keynote, we were kind of which has created in Scotland. It took us seven years to manage to do it. Um, but I have to say, um, I think it was a big success. It's the biggest OER conference to date. 
Um, I think next year it will be even bigger, it's growing year on year. Um, but we had a really, really enthusiastic response. I think we had 180 delegates, 117 sessions. Uh, delegates came from, I think, 29 countries. Um, and we had um, five keynotes um, that really encompassed the whole sort of breadth um, of the conference. The focus of the conference was open culture. And we had keynotes from um, John Scally, the National Librarian of Scotland. We had another from Professor Emma Smith, who's the Professor of Shakespeare Studies at the University of Oxford, and who's very well known for her open podcasts. We had a keynote from uh, Catherine Cronin, who asked the question about what it means to be open in a very personal sense. Um, we had a keynote from Melissa Hylton, who is the Director of Learning, Teaching and Web Services at the University of Edinburgh, who spoke from the institutional perspective of openness. Um, and we had a keynote from Jim Grew, um, who is best known from uh, DS106 and EduPunk and um, Reclaim Hosting fame. It's a really eclectic bunch of keynotes and we've got a very, very positive response to that. So there's a lot going on uh, to promote um, open education across the university. Uh, so just briefly to conclude, <coughs> open education has been used as a key driver to encourage and embed engagement with education technology right across the institution. The University of Edinburgh's vision for open education provides a strong foundation for developing a sustainable model for online education at scale, encouraging engagement with learning technology and OER within the curriculum, and improving teachers' and learners' confidence and digital literacy with regard to teaching and learning online. In addition, this affords the University a valuable opportunity to scale up its community engagement, to disseminate the knowledge created and curated within the institution to the wider community, and to help shape conversations about the role of learning technology and the future of open education in Scotland. So open education is very, very much being used as a driver to encourage this engagement with technology across all parts of the university. So I'm going to stop there now, and having spoken about some of the drivers from the university, I'm going to pass over to Susie, and she's going to talk a little bit about how we can enable staff to really get engaged. Uh, and Susie's going to be talking about um, the university's uh, programme to encourage CMOT registration accreditation. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Gregg and I'm with, um, I have, well, to give you some context, I'm with the Educational Design and Engagement Team, which is part of the Learning, Teaching and Web Division, part of Information Services at the University of Edinburgh. So my placing of my job title maybe gives you an idea of the scale of the in institution that I'm working for. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about professional development for learning technologists and why we're going to start using an, inter uh, an institutional cohort approach to CMOT accreditation. Um, just for context, the University of Edinburgh is um, structured around three colleges, which is broken down into 20 schools and three support groups. We've got around 35,000 students and staff numbers are 9,000 as full-time equivalent, but that actually breaks down into a, a lot more individuals. And the map shows you the various locations across the city. So just to give you the flavour that we're big and we're devolved and we're not, a lot of us aren't co-located. Um, so when I, I was tasked with looking at this piece of work to look at um, accreditation learning technologists, so the first thing I did was try and get a picture of how many learning technology staff there are at the university and I'll speak a little moment uh, in a moment about the drivers we have at the University of Edinburgh and so I'm using um, learning technology as a bit of a shorthand for learning technology and online learning development posts so to get an idea of the number of people in, in these type of posts I started looking at um, job titles um, on our website so a search for learning technology group brings you up a few people but when you keep looking these are 
a sample of the kinds of job titles. So this is it's, it's kind of there's a lot of people doing similar work in different locations with different job titles. So I came I came to the numbers that are above. So in I'm 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 in central support. So I think within central support there may be around 25 people who would be interested or eligible for CMOLT accreditation and in the schools is probably about 55. So not enormous numbers but quite quite large numbers of learning technologists working across the whole institution. And the, the major strategic drivers here, Lona has already spoken about the increase in online distance learning. So our strategic plan is just coming to the end at the moment. So in it was a clear support for new learning technologies and that stated that we were looking to enable our staff to embrace new technologies as part of enhancing the learning experience and to deliver prompt and effective feedback. Because obviously everybody is very concerned about feedback. And in terms of our strategic vision for 2025, uh, many more students benefiting from the Edinburgh experience largely or entirely in their own country, supported by deep international partnerships and world leading online distance learning. So, look, so our institution is trying to place itself with the capacity to grow in these areas and our um, decision to support CMOP for staff is part of our um, approach to building capacity and supporting the staff to develop. So why did we choose CMOP rather than other um, professional accreditation? We're actually quite um, there's quite a lot of support a lot already offered within the institution. Staff can take on the postgraduate certificate in academic practice, and that's um, accredits you to the level two of the HEA fellowship. There's funding for the postgraduate certificate in digital education. Again, that will you can be accredited to HEA fellowship, and there's also an internal um, scheme to support people to do all four levels of the um, HEA. Um, fellowships and that's supported in house and called the Edinburgh Teaching Award. So there's actually quite a lot of support within the institution for, for getting a teaching qualification. But what we like about CMOLT is the broader emphasis on technology and on professional recognition in the field of learning technology. So certified membership of the Association for Learning Technology is a very good fit for us and just to make this clear, these are the alt principles and values on which the scheme is based. So learning technology is a broad range of communication, information and related technologies that can be used to support learning, teaching and assessment. And the principles and values that inform the development of the scheme are a commitment to exploring and understanding the interplay between technology and learning, a commitment to keep up to date with new technologies, and empathy and willingness to learn from colleagues from different backgrounds and specialist options and a commitment to communicate and disseminate effective practice. And that very well summed up what we were hoping to develop, the, the sort of um, values we're hoping to um, encourage in our staff. So our, our aim is to support colleagues working in schools, colleges, or in the information services group to become CMOLT accredited. And the challenge we've set ourselves is to, and just because it's easier to set a challenge to work towards, we want to see if we can make the University of Edinburgh the employer with the largest number of CMOT accredited staff in the UK. I think it would be what we had to <laughs> um, I'm assuming that most people are aware of CMOT as a scheme. Just very, very briefly, if you're not, it is um, it's a recognition. So once you've done the, you, you basically you, you're going to document and reflect on your work. It's about keeping pace with technology. It's a scheme that's certified by peers, so once you're CMOLT accredited, you can become a CMOLT assessor. And there's this process for updating your certification every three years. Um, it's a recognition of your of your role and, and the work that you've been doing. You can add the, the letter CMOLT after your name, and it is frequently desirable criteria for advertised jobs. Um, and it's recognised across the sector, so um, FE, HE, school, transferable. So from the point of view of people in learning technologies, post it's good, it's transferable, it's got kind of currency outside our institution. Um, to put together your CMOT portfolio, it's basically a, por a portfolio in whatever system you choose to use. I used Pebblepad several years ago. 
You describe what you've done, you reflect on this, and you provide supporting evidence across five areas, and there are three windows for assessment, February, June, and October. So why don't people complete, complete it? So this was one of the first things we thought about. CMOT's a great scheme, it's been around for a number of years, and when you speak to learning technologists, a lot of people do know about it. So we kind of feel like, well, what is it that stops people from, from doing it? And we, was, we, we think social isolation is probably a factor, so a way around that is we're going to support people in a group of applicants. Um, we think lack of line management support can be a problem because it takes time to reflect and it takes time to write these things and to collect the evidence. So we are lucky we have um, high level support for the scheme and uh, people at high level talking to the right people to kind of get the buy-in, which is what we want. And we're also going to put in a very light touch application form so that everyone who comes into the scheme gets a line manager sign off and we make it clear that there will be a time commitment within work, the working day to take part. Um, the other thing that sometimes stops people completing is gathering the evidence. It's difficult to kind of sometimes work out how what you do fits in with, the, with areas of experience. So often it's a case of the way you think about your work. But it may be that some people need to actually take on new pieces of work to gather the evidence for certain sections. Um, so we're going to provide training events and support to focus on filling in gaps so that when people come across these gaps they're not left on their own kind of going up stuck and I don't know where to go from here. And the last thing I think that stops people is finding time to write. So we're going to start, uh, we're going to provide writing retreats. I'll talk a wee bit more about what this will look like. So, um, so we're very excited about supporting a group of CMOP applicants and that we're not the first person to come up with this idea by a long shot. So there are institutions with CMOP groups in the UK and in Australasia and um, in the UK these include UCL, Imperial, Imperial at Bloomsbury Group, Ma uh, Queen Mary's in London, Plymouth, Nottingham without the extra T, York, Glasgow and Edgehill and um, Alt were kind enough to supply me that list and to also put me in touch with some of the people who've been working on the schemes in other institutions. So um, when I'm a little bit later in the process it might be quite interesting to share a little bit of the advice they gave me but I didn't check with them before today so I'm not sure how much of it was, was kind of off the record or how much of it's on the record. So, um, so the plan that we have at the moment um, we're going to fund CMOT registration for participants. So what that actually means is they just need to submit the portfolio. But to make, to make it a bit more likely that people will actually complete, we're going to um, provide presentations. Now I'm going to talk in the next slide a little bit more about what I mean by the whole community. So if there's subjects that we think are relevant to everyone, we'll do them as a, publicly, um, a public lecture which anyone can go to or a public event. So we won't close it down to the cohort. But I think there are certain things that the group who are applicants together will want to do together and these are the little blue regular meetings maybe every month to six weeks we'll get together, we'll, I think we had an introduction, we'll deal with the sections one, two, three, four, then their um, specialist option and then the last three are kind of a bit loose to try and finish but it maybe we need to kind of go back to certain areas if, if, if those are areas where people are finding it more difficult to write. And we're going to produce, uh, we're going to offer some writing retreats. So this looks great, but I had the slight fear of doing it all myself, and then I realised there's lots of support in place for uh, for doing this already at my institution and out with. So Alt have already provided a great deal of support material about doing CMOT. So it's great that we can work with with Alt on this. Um, at the University of Edinburgh, we're very lucky, we have a quite well-established community called the e-learning at ed community, and this is a cross-institution grouping of learning <coughs> technologists, learning um, technology practitioners, people who are just interested. It's very much open mailing list, open invites, and uh, every year they do like a big university um, e-learning conference. So basically, we don't, we're, what we're trying to do is feed into a community that already exists. So when we're going to do the presentations to the whole community, we'll do them within, within that, that bigger um, organisation that already exists. So at the moment, the, the subjects we know we're going to be looking at are, for example, openness and copyright. 
so we have experts that we can invite to speak about these things and um, records management is another aspect and part of this will be helping people network and make connections between, within the expertise that is already available within the university because when you come into work at the university if you're based in a school maybe out of the central area you it can you, it, it, it might be years before you realise there are people in records management who can run ideas pass. You can just have a chat to them about, we're thinking of doing this, does this have any implications that we need to think about? Um, and it's much better to meet them at these kind of meetings than, you know, a bit down the line if they're pulling you up on something they're not so happy about. Um, so the educational design and engagement team that I'm involved in will provide what I've described as ongoing support and general cheerleading. There were some great ideas in the session earlier about timelines and regular emails and that's exactly the kind of thing I'm going to think about. And then within the university, our Institute for Academic Development has expertise in facilitating and supporting writing retreats, so we're hoping to work with them to organise the writing retreats with staff. Okay, so um, I've, I've presented this at, at, at an early stage, we're planning on starting our scheme in August, so if you have any questions about what we've got in mind or any suggestions, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. And also, if anyone is doing anything like this where they're adding an institutional wrapper onto another, um, an external accreditation scheme, that would be really interesting. So. How many people have got signed up as institutions? Um, 17 interested. I haven't got the applications out yet, so I, I'm, I'm interested to see how much of this translates because I need to get the paperwork to my own to support. What can it cost, does it, to put some interest? It's £150 per, per applicant, but if you have a cohort of more than 10, there's a 20% discount. So we were quite keen to get a lot of 10. And there's a, also a 10% discount if you get from five. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> Oh, I'm a little keen to this box, I don't know the answer. Uh, there are five people that um, CBA currently sponsor who are doing the CMO um, across colleges in Scotland. And, it, and we have another five places that we will be offering um, to members within um, Scotland's colleges. Yeah. And you, you, I didn't know if the rule going, that's why I was asking. And are you, are you offering any support to them around completing or are you funding them or? We're <coughs> Hosting uh, a, a group of, of the Scottish Learning Technology Network. Okay. And within that, we intend to embed some of the CMOLs for um, similar to what you're suggesting here. Yeah, I, I, did, I didn't mention it. One of the things that the Educational Design and Engagement Team does, they have a, we run a monthly meeting for learning technologists, which is a kind of showcase event. And one of the things we want to do is embed this within that so that people who aren't doing CMOL right now are aware that other people are and that they it might be something of interest or just could cherry pick the bits that they are interested in because it's all around you know um, networking and community building rather than seeing what is kind of a little bit of a vehicle for us. I'll take that forward. Any other 
questions? <laughs> Thanks to my work, I've been taking notes all the time to the organisations. I bet there is more speaking about anything, but just, just sucking in lots of really, really, really useful stuff. And uh, I'm just so impressed by the, the set of these things. Mean, it's, it's just, you can see how, how engaged you are, and you can see how engaged all your students and staff are, are, are with it. So it was great to come to the college so the universities can see that colleges do this too. <laughs> and I, 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 what, what we really need is, is, is that, and that's why I think all that's important is as, as, as a bridge uh, between, 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 the, between the two sectors. Uh, I think also more so, and it wasn't really drawn out, the, the procurement framework landscape that we're, the, 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 we're, moving, the moving, we're moving towards, uh, the bit that hasn't been mentioned at all is sheer services. And to me that that's the next logical thing, that as we move up into the cloud, uh, yes, you have to protect your student data and all these other bits and pieces, but actually there's better value to be gained around some of these things than actually, actually sharing, sharing a platform. And this is heresy, a platform that might not be in an institution, it might actually sit out on the cloud, it might be a service that you, you buy. But the only way we're going to get to that bit for our learners is if, the, if, if universities and colleges actually, actually work together and speak together and are confident uh, that, that, that we, 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 we can carry this, this technology. It's okay, that's fine. Um, we said we finished at quarter two, so I don't want to say very much, but just thanks to everyone for coming. And a huge thank you to Jan and her colleagues at the Dean Angus College for hosting us and putting on such a fantastic display of all the innovative things they're doing. So thank you very much. And thanks also to all for sponsoring our catering, etc. today, for supporting the Special Interest Group. And just to repeat again what um, Martin mentioned earlier, if you're not already a member of ALT, if your organisation isn't already a member of ALT, please look at it and encourage your organisation and also individually if you want to join. It's not that expensive, it's about £50 a year or something. So it's, it's really worth it to be part of the network. Um, I think in the future, the special interest groups are going to be looking at um, the level of membership across participants. So it's really worthwhile having a look at that. But thanks again for coming. Continue to share what you're doing. Use the, the Alt Scotland uh, mail list. And as I said before, if anyone wants to get more involved in the Alt Scotland um, steering group committee, then please get in touch and let us know. But stay home and hope you enjoy some more sunshine. <laughs>